right. Well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, this is um, Chad Serhal's um, uh, reading for his defense of his thesis um, and for his exhibition and project in lieu of thesis, Rayvon 1958. Um, before I read his abstract, which kind of contextualizes the exhibition, um, you know, I just want to mention, you know, this is obviously Chad's third year here at UF, and he's done a variety of shows, been active exhibiting throughout Florida, and had an uh, exhibition in South Korea, and um, is very active with the with uh, clubs on campus, the Cut Club that he started, and um, has helped. Uh, has taught classes, has helped um, assist with some of the classes that myself and Coco Fusco have taught and has been extremely helpful in all ways. And then also when he's not doing all this work that we're about to see him talk about, he also uh, helps out with the visiting artist program. So he's somebody that's a kind of a huge part of our School of Art and Art History community. And we um, greatly appreciate everything that he's done in his time here. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I will read his um, kind of abstract statement and then he will uh, present for about 30 minutes. Oh, um, my name is Sean Miller um, and I'm an associate professor here at the School of Art and History and I'll let the other committee members also introduce themselves briefly before we get started. Hey, my name is Sergio Vega. I am a professor in uh, the sculpture and the photo department. My name is Rachel Silveri. I am an assistant professor of art history here in the School of Art and Art History. I am Trevor Mauchin, uh, assistant professor in film studies and production in the English department at uh, UF here. So, so the, what we'll do, thank you everybody. What we'll do is we'll um, have uh, Chad um, uh, read from his, his thesis writing and present some of the work and discuss that. and. We'll do that for about 30, 35, 40 minutes. And then we will um, take, then the committee will ask questions. Um, and once the committee has asked uh, one or two questions each, then we'll um, open it up to everybody. And you can all ask Chad for more context on some of the things that he's presenting or follow up. And then we will adjourn the public part of the meeting and um, and and, we'll, and the committee will, We'll meet and talk, and then we'll come back and talk to Chad at the end. Um, so, um, talking about Ray Vaughan, Ray Vaughan, uh, 1958 is the title of his thesis, pro of Chad's thesis project. And for this exhibition, um, he practices collage techniques um, and collage using a variety of media, working within a variety of different media. Um, the work for the exhibition includes cl um, collage items such as paper photo, photographic slides, video, sound, and, uh, and object archives, whereby found materials are combined, examined, repurposed, and reappropriated. Um, using a technique um, um, Chad calls SCUS, information like images and movies, comics, magazines, or books are manipulated through collage. This process uses additive, extractive, and abstracting measures to, abstracting measures to either generate expressive energy or subversively negate the power of the appropriated materials. The show's title is an acronym for how his work functions, reappropriate, animate, vivify, extract, opus novus, um, spelling, Ravon, which um, is also Chad's favorite 1950 songs recorded by Buddy Holly in 1958. Ravon 1958 is a study on the collection in the forms. Is it a collection? It is a collection of souvenirs in the form of a video performance, a collection of images and films in the form of an animation, and an idiosyncratic archive built from a constellation of personal and cultural references. Rayvon 1958 is inspired by collage artists Kurt Schwitters, Ray Johnson, Joseph Cornell, and Marcel Duchamp, who experiment with other ways an artist can collect, reappropriate, and think about objects and images. So I'll turn it over to Chad. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Sean, and um, the, the rest of the committee. Uh, first, I wanna thank the Academy. Um, second, uh, I'd like to thank my partner, Katie, 
who's been my coach and kind of got me here. Um, very thankful uh, for her support. And um, then I'll also Jane, who's her, her roommate and, um, and like the Gertrude, Gertrude Stein of uh, artists in, uh, in the land and Gainesville uh, and uh, my fellow grads who I miss dearly this year. Um, and also Brad uh, in the wood shop, who's, who's kind of the Yoda of the sculpture department. Okay, um, let's just let's take a deep breath. Someone stop me if I'm, if I have uh, frozen up or something, I can't, can't, can't even tell. Um, let me talk about the show first. And get, get a rhythm going here. A large portion of the collage collection known as SCUS 1 and SCUS 2 are in the thesis show. SCUS 1, there is a variety of references to film, vintage comics, bowling imagery, drawings of shapes and objects, or compositions with paper uh, and paint. The curved wall in the University Gallery was painted the color fuchsia, which was named after a botanist by the name Fuchs, like the University of Florida President Fuchs. Fuchs published a collection of 500 detailed woodcut drawings of plants. The new color was invented in 1858. I arranged the collages on the curved wall in groups of five and eight in a pattern that represents, um, yeah, I'm behind, represents the chemistry of fuchsia, uh, two-tone second wave ska, and bowling pin positions. Uh, ap Aprophenia is uh, a mental illness that is the tendency to perceive meaningful connections between unrelated things. This uh, condition was coined in 1958. Uh, in SCUS 2, there are scenes from movies and vintage comics, comic books with topics about romance and hot rods. Uh, letters from movie posters are SCUSed into each design like paint splatter. The SCUS cards project comes from a process of taking my card collection from 1988 to 1994 and destroying them only to rise them again as Art Reborn to Rave On. Each card has been scuzzed as well as collaged onto or manipulated in other ways. The ways of holding cards, three ring binders, the top loaders, plastic protective cases are true to collectible memorabilia. Art slides are repurposing of old discarded photographic slides from the University of Florida's Art History Slide Library that once contained images from art history, but now contains scuzz. Uh, the reference to the art is still on the label, but the art slide itself has been replaced with a collage between the glass panes. It is an experiment in the repurposing of slides, reappropriation of art history and uh, archival practices, as well as working with the limitations of one square inch and one millimeter of depth. In collections with Jane, I put together three collections of objects. Each object meant something to me and I had a slight narrative in mind, but the experiment was to see what meanings and narratives arose with the content, uh, the context of the objects as souvenirs removed. The great American motion picture rotoscope animation is about referencing the scope of influence and the collection of an identity through a lifetime of film obsession. Similar to my ability to relate and connect my everyday experience with a moment in cinematic history, these films weave into each other through conceptual or visual overlap and a system of connections that transcend time and space, diegesis, and genre. The reappropriating of the scenes claim them as my own, focusing on the importance of the moment and blending them into a constellation of art and ideas. So we're gonna talk about three themes. First one is reference. 
A reference is not a metaphor. It doesn't fully stand for something else. It's not a breadcrumb trail because it's not leading you back to the place you came from. It's more of a rabbit hole that takes you to another space time and leads to further discoveries, correspondences, and more complex connections. How does this collage connect Buddy Holly and Ray Vaughn to James Dean and this image? Maybe a better question should be, how doesn't it? Because the rest of this talk could easily be spent connecting the two. These are some of my favorite things to talk about and to connect to, so please allow me to indulge. The key is locations, Marfa, Texas, Clovis, New Mexico, and names like Norman, Newman, and Nelson. And the theme of death and the attempt to overcome it through other measures of existence will be repeated will be a repeated concept. The main source of this collage was from a photo taken in Marfa, Texas on the set of Giant. It is an icon performed by icons. Words have a way of emerging in these collages. The word Norman, oh, icon made of icons, yeah. The word Norman is al almost seen in the left group of letters at the bottom. The, the red A the white background is from a Norman Rockwell book cover. Norman Rockwell is famous for depicting iconic images. Philip Norman wrote Ray Vaughan, the biography of Buddy Holly. Norman Petty produced the recording of Ray Vaughan in his studio in Clovis, New Mexico. Okay, you gotta, you gotta bear, bear with this. Uh, writer and director Steve Clovis filmed Flesh and Bone, 1993, in Marfa, Texas, starring Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan, seen here in a motel in Marfa, Marfa Texas. Uh, Dennis Quaid starred in a film called Breaking Way, which was filmed in Bloomington, Indiana, where, where I went to undergrad. And Meg Ryan currently lives in Bloomington, Indiana with John Cougar Mellencamp, who recorded a version of Rave On for the film Cocktails, starring Tom Cruise. My favorite film, Badlands, is based on a true story about a murder spree that happened in 1958. Uh, the idea of James Dean is used as a motif. It shows the strength of his paratextual afterlife. On the right, there's nearly the word muerte, which is Spanish for death. And lower is the word breve, which is Spanish for brief. James Dean and Buddy Holly live short lives, 24 and 22. Dean in a car, Holly in a plane. Buddy Holly's favorite actor was James Dean. Okay, this is, this is more of a stretch, more of a stretch here. Um, also recorded near Clovis, New Mexico was Wyatt Earp, starring Dennis Quaid again, and Kevin Costner. Costner was in a film called Fandango, where college kids took a pilgrimage to Marfa, Texas, to the site where Giant was filmed. Costner in the movie says, can you imagine James Dean walking around right out here? Then Dago co-stars co Judd Nelson, Nelson, Norman, Newman, Donald Judd, Marfa, Texas. Costner was in uh, Waterworld with Dennis Hopper, who co-starred with James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause and Giant. Buddy Holly died in a cornfield in Iowa in 1959 Costner starred in Field of Dreams in 1989, which was about a cornfield in Iowa containing a portal to the afterlife. His name was Ray Kinsella. Ray Kinsella. Uh, supposedly, Liz Taylor and James Dean had stayed up late many nights sharing intimate stories about their lives with each other. Uh, and Dean was said to have mentioned a period of time that he was abused by it a minister after his mother had died between 9 and 11. The story gives weight to this image. Paul Newman poses in this position in Cool Hand Luke after eating 50 eggs. Newman played boxer Rocky Barbella in Somebody Up There Likes Me in a role Dean was contracted to play, co-starring with the woman who broke Dean's heart, Pierre Angeli, who got married in a church in LA as Dean revved his motorcycle engine outside like John Boy 
in the film September 30th, 1955 from 1977, which was about kids grappling with James Dean's death. Newman Box and Cool Hand Luke and Dennis Hopper was in that one too. Paul Newman died during Fairmount, Indiana's James Dean Days Festival in 2008. It could be argued that the letters uh, on the left actually spelled Newman. Um, why James Dean? Uh, I, I was always aware of James Dean, but it wasn't until I moved away in the early 2000s that I began to identify with him, understanding a sense of alienation and desire to connect to Indiana. He grew up in a neighboring town. Dean's tragic loss of his mother and the abandonment of his father, the simultaneous displacement of uh, moving from California to Indiana at age nine, having that need for love, but fear of closeness, the desire to rise out of a small town and do great things to gain the recognition he felt he lacked, defined him. Identifying with who he was as a person, seeing the 16 month career explosion, his tragic and prophetic way of dying at age 24, two amazing films being released posthumously, then the iconic aftermath that ensued that is still going on. This is what makes his iconicity more mystical and powerful. Dean's life and art were transparently similar. The tragic person who played tragic characters died tragically before people even knew who he was. The, uh, the documentary, The James Dean Story, directed by Robert Altman, fused Dean's life, stardom, and legacy. It was filmed two, two years after he died uh, and did every book and magazine, so did every book and magazine that came out for the next few years. This gave his image so many facets and identifiable traits to latch on to. As the years went on, I took more and more pilgrimage to, pilgrimages to his grave, attending the James Dean Days Festival, spent more time thinking about him and other connections with historical figures and events. Ultimately, I don't think words can describe how deeply woven James Dean is in how I experience the world now. If you're not a Deaner, you won't understand. Guide to Boards uh, writes in Society of the Spectacle, quote, real life is material, materially invaded by the contemplation of the spectacle and ends up absorbing it and aligning itself with it, end quote. The world that I know is the spectacle and nothing else. It's, it's being pushed on me in order to generate revenue. The best thing I can do is to actively seek out information instead of letting it being fed to me. Learning about good art and passing it on is a major part of my life and art practice. As a teenager growing up in the 90s in North Central Indiana, I had to seek out information. The history of music and film was an oral history told by movie and record store employees. There was no information superhighway. It was an off-road experience. My, my style of creating has been referencing, referencing other work using film and music to tell a narrative in an original song. By using sound clips from movies or pulling lines from songs and writing words around them, I was better able to express what I was feeling. Then later referencing movies and music to tell stories in comic book form crossed my work over into visual art. Like a graphic novel, uh, like my graphic novel, Thunder Road, which was about a trip to James Dean's grave told around the lyrics of Bruce Greenstein's Thunder Road. But it was really about the beginnings of a relationship and our interests aligning. Or the song Means Nothing, which uses 12 Springsteen song titles to tell the story about the end of that relationship. By doing that, I can conjure each of those songs and what they mean to me, provoking a multitude of associations for, for the listener. Choosing references that were interesting to me and under the radar of most was a form of speaking the language of cool culture. Lux Interior of the Cramps described 50s DJs as revolutionaries speaking to the youth masses over their airwaves. They wouldn't get pulled from the air because no adult knew what they were talking about. They were speaking in this, this kind of language using film, TV, and music references and made up phrases that only made sense in cultural context. The song Ray Vaughn is an example of a catchphrase that kids were saying about feeling 
feeling of love and maybe more. Other songs on the same album like You're So Square and Ready Teddy were also youth culture phrases used for communication and to subvert censorship. Ray Vaughn actually is a line appropriated from a Carl Perkins song, Dixie Fried. Dixie Fried was a reference to drinking Dixie beer. Dixie beer changed their name in 2021, I think in January, to Faubourg Brewing Company in light of the Black Lives Matter movement. Faubourg Fried is much catchier anyway. Uh, the company was founded in, in 1907 by a man named Mertz. That will come back later. Uh, in, in an interview in 1977, Ray Johnson randomly brought up the Baroness von Freytag Lorhaven. Lor Lorhaven. I always mess that up. Since uh, saying she was a shocking punk lady of her time, knowing the interviewer would not have heard of her, nor would any other people at that time, she only recently had been brought up as uh, an early influential member of Dada, the Dada movement and possibly the uh, original R. Mutt of Duchamp's Fountain. This reference had made uh, reference he made was for the interviewer to look up later and for the people reading the article to look up and discover this unusual artist that was overlooked. He loved knowing these things and sharing the passion with others. Johnson homages people in his own way. Based on my own readings of his work, he uses Gertrude Stein to talk about art critique, Jackson Pollock to talk about popularity of abstract expressionism, uh, reference Andy Warhol making fun of pop art, Duchamp for conceptualism, or Robert Rauschenberg as Black Mountain's success story, sellout from a place of love slash envy. For regular people, it was their names that intrigued him. The endless possibilities to connect and rearrange their name with other connections drove much of his correspondences. William S. Wilson wrote, Ray Johnson acknowledges the complexity, mystery, multiplicity, and shifting nature of meaning, and how meaning is not something the, the work itself demands. While a work may have certain meaning to the artist, meanings are also co-created with the person on the other end of the viewer, the reader, the interviewer, and meanings like people can change. This co-creation is important to how the work functions. The interviewer needs to, the viewer needs to really study the piece, trying to make sense of it, or maybe only appreciate it for its surface level and later finding meaning in it. When reading a sentence, the value of each word is assessed and are added together to complete a thought. Each word has correlation to a reader that is specific to that reader. The slight coloration of interpretation of each word makes language problematic at times, but is the beauty of communication. According to Judith Butler, every utterance and every individual action needs to be part of a conventional context in order to be understandable and recognizable. It can only, can only create an impact by drawing upon certain conventions. I understand that sometimes there is not an understanding of context that the viewer is bringing to the art and therefore no entry point, as they say in all of my critiques. But I believe if you sit with the work long enough, entry points will open up. Uh, Janine Platel in the book Collage uh, says, the viewer perceiving a collage was no longer a passive spectator or reader stationed outside the picture frame or the text. He or she had to make the necessary connections and by this active interpretation act, become a part of the collage environment itself. In Duchamp's lecture, The Creative Act, he says, all in all, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualities and thus adds his uh, contribution to the creative act. The viewer getting excited about the work identifying the signs and the message, connecting the ideas or the collage inspires a discovery that the viewer carries with them forever, growing into more discovery. 
That is the goal of the work. Okay, part two, reappropriation. I don't know where we're at on time, but hopefully it's not bad. Um, okay, a dumpster, a dumpster dove library archive of art slides made of plas heavy plastic and glass with removed film and remains of titles, archival system dates, artists and theoretical sizes turn into art, two panes of one inch three by four ratio glass within the off white plastic frame provides a well-defined diegesis of diegesis in which a collage can be contained. In this world, the U from a UPS stamp can be the central focus of a composition due to the size relativity of printed matter. An endless array of possibilities meets a structure conducive to archiving material, meets the subversion of conventions of how an art slide operates, meets interesting archaic paraphernalia of cases and containers for this medium to be stored and shown in interesting ways. The art slides are the missing link between SCUS 1 and SCUS 2. They allow me to finally feel comfortable experimenting with nouveau realism styles and collages with transparent negative space, the ability to focus on one small piece of paper or a large series by only using one source. When appropriating my card collection, I began reevaluating why I collected these specific cards and, and have kept them in near mint condition for over 30 years. In the end, all these cards are valueless, monetarily speaking, but now they are original works of art while still holding the power of an original piece of collectible sports history. Even though they are in the same form in the same containers viewed in the same way, their ownership, identity, and value has been altered. More has been added to the cards as well as been taken away, causing them to be on a different scale of value. A style that Kurtz Fitters and later uh, Nouveau, Nouveau Realisme group were known for is using the effect of the palimpsest. The term palimpsest comes from a manuscript that is engraven, being scraped off or reused, but traces of it remain so that early, earlier scripts can be faintly seen behind the new scripts. The palimpsest, the, the collision or the collusion of time and space, the humming of harmonies, of color and texture, the mysticism of the ghostly unknown past met with the frail war-torn present forms of future image that can't quite be uncovered. Hidden messages or pieces of paper buried in sanded layers of household paint. Time and memory are side by side or how else can 50 years seem like yesterday? The palimpsest is a physical embodiment of that. Robert Motherwell, who made collages, wrote about the Dada movement and was leader in the American abstract expressionism movement, explained how he views abstraction in a documentary about the artists who were involved in the movement. The function of abstraction is to get rid of a lot of reality. You start with as much richness as you want and subtract. Then you arrive at the residue of the essences that you are interested in. So much of my work is experimenting with stripping down of information. The residue that is left and the vague traces of the past can be so much more powerful and beautiful. Looking at the ways other artists have reappropriation have used reappropriation will better contextualize how I incorporate this philosophy. Marcel Duchamp uh, took ordinary objects and displayed them as art, sometimes changing them very little or not at all. His philosophy on appropriation was one of his greatest contributions. Joseph Cornell collected humble materials, reminiscence, epiphanies, and objects with special magic to form his collages. They were sentimental homages, um, his his boxes were portals to another place at another time that he thought, he thought about extensively. When Cornell and Duchamp met, first met in New York, they connected over their love of Paris. 
They talked about their favorite restaurants, architecture, parks, and streets. And after about an hour of reminiscing, Cornell said after a long sigh, yes, I do wish to visit someday. He had never left New York, but lived in an explorer's life through objects and ephemera. He, he mixes and matches symbolic images with nostalgic references to realize a new world that yearns for the old world. Ray Johnson's Cornell boxes were mailboxes, and his way of reappropriating was his ability to correspond an image or word with the person's work, life, or even the spelling of their name. His vast knowledge of art, music, film, and culture in general was put to use with every collage he would mail out to people on his list. Johnson used Rene Marguerite's work on the relationship with words, images, and meaning and repeated the imagery of the pipe from treachery of the images in order to redirect an image's potential meaning. Semiotics tell us that the relationship between the signified and the signifier are arbitrary, and that fact can easily be exploited for games of reappropriation. Here he uses modicos to code a message that is coded, that is a coded message about the concept. I, follow, I found this image yesterday while trying to put the slideshow together and cried. It's just absolutely perfect for the slideshow. Um, John Baldessari would take a scene from a book or movie and write the description on the canvas in order for the viewer to imagine the image. He would sing Solowitz sentences on conceptual art. He would put a color dot over faces of figures in his images to take away their identity and value. Christian Mark Clay derives all of his ideas from the concepts of sound. A large print of someone screaming, a collage of sound emanata from comics, new ways of thinking about physicality of records and CDs, uh, repeatedly focusing on sound surrounding telephones and concentrating on time and the clock. Hip hop sampling is, a, is the appropriation of earlier recording. Each sample has a weight of nostalgia and history linking to the whole original recording. It's used as another instrument that evokes an emotional response. The Smith's lyrics are appropriated lines from literature, songs, and movies to express how one feels. As to say, I relate to these things, they speak for me, they speak to me and for me. As an act of subversion, the front cover of, the, of LPs and singles are not of the band, but of movie references several referencing James Dean. One has the idea of Dean from the presence of his hand, but is cropped out of the, of the promo photo from East of Eden. An on set photo of co-star Richard Davalos looking down at Dean, cropped out, sitting on the ground, sitting below him. Uh, my band did the same thing uh, with our first record, like over his shoulder. Um, all of these photos used came from James Dean, American Icon, this book, which came out a year before Smith's first album. One of the keys to understanding the Smith's covers is this book. Remove this source and the imagery, the images are an enigma. Another thing to point out is the images are paratextual, on set, uh, behind the scenes imagery that ideally portray these people as real people instead of actors. The Dean and Taylor crucifixion image as well is not in the movie Giant. It's just a stage photograph. Uh, like Duchamp, his everyday object ready-mades, the Smith's covers try to show a moment of unexpected ordinary, er, ordinariness and present it as something magical, as a result, making it magical. Julie J. Thompson wrote in her book of interviews of Ray Johnson that he elevates the minor and deflates the major. My way of reappropriating is a little like all of these, but especially like Johnson's and the Smith's covers. I play with images and words, and I use an off-center focus in subject matter. My first year, I did a piece called 81 Fountains, where I took Duchamp's fountain and created 81 perm permutations of it as a wood burn. Then I rendered 48 Kurt Schmitter's collages with a light pencil and picked the second most prominent element of each collage and I outlined it with red ink. These two pieces are my way of examining them apart to see how they work. 
The present youth culture has collaged together an array of styles from the 90s. In a way, they have rewritten history in to form their own seemingly arbitrary to an outsider collection of what aesthetics to take from this time period. It, it is more complicated when you see that 90s collage together styles from the 70s and 50s and pieces of that collection have entered into fashion of today. Susan Sontag's famous definition in her 1964 essay, Notes on Camp, Camp asserts that good taste is not necessary, uh, not simply good taste, that there exists indeed a good taste of bad taste. It is these kinds of choices that interest me. Back when clothing styles were based on what music you listened to, clothing yourself was more of an act of collection, reference, and reappropriation, and a fashion statement. Uh, SCUS is a fashion statement. Okay, third part. Last part, I'm so sorry, um, the collection. The collection is a process I have participated in since childhood with things like bug collections, card collections, foreign money, and even a notebook where I wrote down numbers. I admired my parents' and grandparents' collection of stamps, radio equipment, trophies, records, fishing tackle, precious moments, sculptures, and sad hobo clown paintings. In the year Years 2005 to 2008, I amassed over 2,000 VHS tapes, hundreds of records by circulating the half price bookstore, flea market, family videos, and record stores of the Midwest. A good example of a discovery collection and a reference to rev reverence as reverence would be R. Crumb's Heroes of Blues, Jazz, and Country. In it was drawings of Crumb. Crumb did of his favorite musicians in three genres of old tiny music. Identify with someone saying, look at this, this is what I love. Crumb has massive and has a massive and priceless connection collection of 78s and has spent most of his life building that collection. I feel the passion in this book. I looked up every single musician in the library database. I learned all their fascinating backstories from pre and post Great Depression that and the American Anthology of Folk Music inspired me to record four tribute albums of my favorite discoveries. These discoveries led me to other discoveries which I have tried to pass on to others. The great motion picture rotoscope animation included in this thesis show is a collection of reappropriated references. It is un unlikely that anyone has seen all of these films and if they have, they may consider rewatching one they didn't think much of due to me having placed it on a list of 100 favorites. It's always shocking to hear what people's favorite movies are. It makes, makes me want to rewatch them to better understand why. This list will cause someone to think, how could this movie be on the list, but this other movie not? Or how could someone with seemingly good taste include that movie? The value of this collection will and should be questioned um, or investigated. The making of this piece was heavily a process study requiring decisions to be made through each step. It came from a desire to reanimate familiar scenes of 100 of my favorite American films. Uh, these are films that I have seen many times, my deserted island films, uh, most important to me or most influential to my humor, logic, style, or aesthetic. The materials used were oil, pastel, acrylic paint, watercolor ink, marker, colored pencil, paper, and graphite. Color, medium, and rendering style were inspired by the film being depicted, but also the film I was watching or music I was listening to at the time, as well as the rotoscope anim animation artist, Jeff Schur. The archaic technique of rotoscope animation is in harmony with the analog score that is a collaboration with my grandfather who sent a Morse code message to me via cassette tape though the mail uh, through the mail during the COVID pandemic. I then added tones and melodies with a 70s Moog synthesizer to the, to, to the recording on a four track cassette recorder in sequence with the video. This is his ham radio set up in 1958. 
And this is this is it, him in 1992. And this is a drawing I did of his station in 1991. His uh, call sign is K9 EOG. If you ever if you ever get on. In collections with Jane, I brought together souvenirs into a collection. This collection now grows into many things and examining the connections and relationships the objects might have with one another, especially once the contexts have been removed. Susan Stewart writes in On Longing, while the point of the souvenir may be remembering or at least invention of memory, the point of the collection is forgetting, starting again in such a way that a finite number of elements create by virtue of their combination, an infinite reverie. A new mesh began to grow, connecting each object, completely different than the collector had intended. Susan Stewart writes, it is not a, a narrative of the object, it's a narrative of the possessor. We cannot be, we cannot be uh, proud of someone else's souvenir unless the narrative is extended to include our relationship with the object's owner or unless, as we see later, we can transform the souvenir into the uh, collection. If the collection, unquote, if the, uh, if the collector had given Jane the context of the objects, they would merely be the souvenirs of the collector and hold little intrigue on her. But by removing the context, they became a collection of curiosity and from it, a narrative grew. Artists like Joseph Cornell and Ray Johnson lived in between towers of collected materials. Their body of work was a slow curation and exhibition of their thoughts and interests. For me, it is a gathering, a breaking down and a rebuilding process. A vast collection requires obsessive, compulsive and repetitive collecting. Uh, archiving works come from a need to sustain your existence long after your body is gone. The need to know that your work and a part of you who you are will go on into the future. I feel that that drive and the idea will explain. I feel that drive and the idea would explain my need to create so many collages. I need to create and reproduce out of fear of death. In the last 16 months, Buddy Holly, last 16 months of Buddy Holly and James Dean's life, they had enough documentation made of who they were to last forever. Buddy Holly and James Dean are immortals. Their art and lives continue to be vivified. Their images continue in American iconic fashion, and their art is referenced and reimagined again and again. May they not fade away in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, but rave on. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Pretty good. Um, so now we'll take questions from the um, committee. And I, I have a, I guess I'll start off with the initial, initial kind of question which is, um, I was interested in the part where you're talking about the contemplation of the spectacle and about seeking out information. I'm not sure I'm kind of paraphrasing. Um, and before I go into the question, I'll just put another plug in for Lipstick Traces by Grail Marcus, the book, um, which I think you'll really enjoy, which traces um, situationist international and things like that up into the sex pistols and throughout kind of punk rock history. Um, so I, I think you'll like that book. But so getting back to the contemplation of the spectacle and seeking out information, I'm wondering um, the idea of James Dean being a rebel, it seems to be that you're, you're talking about a specific um, strategy within your collage, but maybe not coming at it directly. It seems to me that would you say that you're rebelling against the passive absorption of cultural information in your work? Like it seems to me that SCUS and all this is your way of not of of saying yes, I'll take in the spectacle that's coming at me, but I will do it uh, on my own terms, one piece of information at a time. And in that case, maybe you're like you're like the James Dean that you enjoy so much. 
uh, in terms of rebelling against this stuff? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think you kind of answered it for me. Um, but it, it's it's the like the need to like kind of go against the mainstream, even if I like what's going on in the mainstream, I'll just kind of find a way to like not like it in my own way. Um, I think I think James Dean was kind of labeled as a rebel in a in a weird afterlife kind of way, especially because he was in that movie called Rebel Without a Cause and all those images from that. Um, but I think he also was a rebel in like the opposite of what people think a rebel is. He's, he was dark and um, like effeminate and had like, he just did his own thing and people were begging him not to and he refused um, with the race car driving and the, and like he wouldn't, he wouldn't back down on like um, how he was going to be per perceived in, in, in public and um, there's all these great stories about that kind of thing. So I, in general, like, I think his image does actually have a rebelliousness to it, but it's usually not the way people talk about. Just just a, a quick follow-up. I, I shouldn't have put James Dean into the question. Like I should have, what I should have done, <laughs> what I should have done is said, what I should have done is, is, is um, because you said I answered the question for you and that made me think I asked the question wrong as well. So I'm really more interested in, in Chad, in Chad's uh, use, uh, rejection of the spectacle, right? As a strategy. So just yeah. a little bit more, pretend I didn't answer the question and that I'm actually trying to get a sense of your methodology and your motivations more and, and what your problem is with the spectacle and, and, and how, how you choose material. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah. Well, I, I think it goes back to, I don't, I don't know if I, have the right answer for you but it it's i i it's the main against the mainstream it's some sort of like sub subversion of subculture with subculture like i don't like listening to the radio because the radio is has been kind of like sterilized and, and the clear channel thing and it's like they're telling me what to listen to i i want to be the dj you know um i think that's an easy way to answer it, and it visually too it's the same way that's great, thanks. I'll I, I, from the I have a rather uh, rhetorical mumbling from which hopefully a, a, a consistent question will arise. Uh, but hey, you know, I feel like I am in your realm, Chad. So you know, please bear with me and see if, if this comes up to being a question or a statement, I don't know. Uh, um, from, from the very beginning, right be, even before you, you came um, to the program here, I was always fascinated by the idea of, of you uh, uh, having such an in, invested personal uh, relationship with this kind of archive of of Americana and embodying, you know, from film history to to music and 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 uh, and comics and, and imagery, uh, and also uh, I noticed this very interesting uh, um, reflection on the idea of taste uh, and and the idea of what's cool, what was cool in the seventies and and not in the fifties, etc. You know, or or, or in the eighties and not in the in the sixties, and and this this kind of uh, um, articulation of those relations, uh, to me, it sort of embodies like almost like a whole field of of dialectical uh, relations and distinctions that you are very aware of and very specific and they're very, very specific. Uh, <clears throat> but, then, but then the kind of, uh, uh, I feel like you have explored something that seems almost, uh, almost impossible. Mm -hmm. I think that you, in my way, you're, you're, what you're trying to do with, and probably that is why you make so many things, right? Is that your your search for me? It's almost like a search for something impossible in these terms. 
as an extension of what I was just telling you, there is a realm of specificity, something incredibly specific about like, the issues of taste or who was in which movie or who said this about what, right? All this specific thing, which makes me think about the historical approaches of someone like Abby Warburg, who was trying to establish a, a transhistorical, uh, you know, relations of meanings that were carried out by images and they could be articulated in specific relations, right, in, in his boards of, of imagery, right? Uh, but then there is this whole, uh, basically that will be the realm of specific symbolism, but then there is a, a, the, the notion of chance that also plays a big part, the randomness, and also the specific erasure of the traces, which will bring you to like the strategies of like decollage and, and things that we have spoken about, right? Uh, <clears throat> then, and then you talk about these, let me find my notes, which are as complicated as yours probably. Uh, the, um, and, and the indeterminacy of the future, mm -hmm. the erasure of the past and determinacy of the future, everything seems to be played out in each one of the collages. It's almost like, it's almost like you know, making like the referent of the image uh, layer so that it's not immediately accessible. And then, you know, the future is not internally attainable. Uh, the idea of the slow perception. So it comes the notion of the space of flux to me as a space of indeterminacy mm, in which uh, uh, this, the, the information has been stripped down and the future is an articulation, a potential future for where this imagery may live. Mm. Uh, I think, I think this, this is this kind of appropriation is a kind of making a your own and I wonder if this whole vast uh, imagery that, that conveys your work is a kind of self-portrait. And if you think about as, uh, as, 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 and if you aspire to be a cult artist, you know, that the viewership will actually see your collages and say, oh, well, this is James Dean from this movie. And I know why he put it here. In the same way, you know, you ex explain to us the thing of the, the, the covers of the Smiths. And, 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 and so for me, the impossible thing is in such a specific field of references that convey your interests and your work and your decisions, how is it that chance allows you to, to make poetic sense of this? I mean, it's, it's like one is it almost scientific, you know, or almost like an archeologist of Americana, you know, Another and another way of it's, it's just like a jazz musician, you know. You're just like, you know, improvising on the moment. So, can you tell us about that a bit more? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the thing I'm thinking about is like if I was allowed to talk ten more minutes, I think that answer would be more apparent. Like my my, you know, I would be able to answer that question um, because uh, I. In the, in the writings, I go into detail about um, this piece of paper of uh, Burl Ives. I don't know if you know who Burl Ives is, but I, I just cut this little tiny piece of paper, pinned it on a cork board outside of my door my first year of grad school. And after my first critique, I felt a little like un non -understood, ununderstood. And I took a picture of that and I wrote about it. And um, I turned that into a more organized um, explanation of how I view the, the material. And the, I guess the point is that um, it, it might seem random, but the, the pieces that are in these collages, I have found at specific locations, have, have brought with me in several moves, five, six moves, three different states. Uh, the piece is cut and then collected into a little like a little con container that has, you know, things similar to it. Um, I, I, I build a relationship with each little piece. And, and so there, you know, the randomness comes in with how the piece is mistreated 
and like the paint and the you know the ripping and the um you know the recklessness of that uh is i think is more uh, uh by chance but but the collecting is really methodical and um there's a time aspect to it uh where i have it quite quite a while i, think, I don't know if that answers your question but and and then the other thing you were saying about a cult artist are you saying either way i'm fine with but if you're saying um people who are into like cult films will will gra gravitate towards my work great and if if my work becomes like a cult art i never even consider that as a possibility but i'm i'm totally down for that um i do feel like in the last three years the one thing that i've accomplished is like uh, creating a visual style that is kind of my own and I and I feel really comfortable with it and am ex you know exploring it experimenting with it but it's still you see it and you know it's me you know and, and yes it is sort of a, of a self-portrait in that way like these are things that I've, you've heard me talk about and, and this is a visual that I support you know this is the kind of thing that I'm into all right all right that that a very good answer. Thank you. It's not easy to be concise. <clears throat> Chad, when I was um, thinking about what I wanted to ask you for this defense, I feel like we've had a couple of meetings within the past few weeks and I've been able, I've already had the opportunity to ask you a lot of questions. And so I thought I would um, borrow from your aesthetic and the issue of reappropriation and ask you the questions that were asked to Andy Warhol in one of his first interviews. Um, this is from Arts Voices, December 1962. And I didn't know how much time we would have, but I think maybe I can, we, can do, we can do this in five minutes. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Yeah. But so I'm gonna set a timer and, it's, and I'm gonna need your active participation in answering briefly. And then if there's leftover time, I'm gonna add my own question. So multiple okay. questions or one question? It's, it's like question after question after question. Warhol answered them quickly. So you gotta answer them quickly, all right? All right, this is good. Ready? Okay. What is SCUS? It's uh, a distress. This is a good way to hold a thesis defense, isn't it? Yes. Is Guz a satiric comment on American life? Yes. Are Marilyn Monroe and Troy Donahue significant to you? No. Why aren't they? Aren't they your favorite movie stars? No, not particularly. Do you feel you pump life into dead cliches? Yeah. Does Scuzz have anything to do with surrealism? Um, sure. Are you sick of this thesis defense? <laughs> no, this is, this is great. Do billboards influence you? Say what? Do billboards influence you? Oh yeah, the, especially the, uh, the ones that haven't been touched in years. Does SCUS defy abstract expressionism? Defy it? I would say they would not approve. Do SCUS artists influence each other? Uh, there's only one of them, and yes. Is SCUS a school? It can be. It can be. How close is SCUS to happenings? It's more of a nothing. What is SCUS trying to say? It's trying to unsay. <laughs> what do your rows of bowling pins signify? It is an order. It's, it's, it's about order. What does Coca-Cola mean to you? It, I think of the word sugar, but uh, more like wallpaper. 
And we have over two minutes left for my own question. So I was struck in your talk, like Sean, between um, the two, two juxtapositions, two quotes, the first being from Guy Debord saying that life has become this spectacle. And you say, the best thing I can do is to actively seek out information instead of letting it be fed to me. And then the second quote from Susan Stewart on collecting, where she says that the point of a collection is, for, is to forget. The point of collecting is forgetting. So I, my question for you is if you can maybe summarize what information do you choose to seek out? What information do you choose to forget and why? Mm. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. So I recently have gotten back into my, my loops of being obsessed with early careers of people like Brad Pitt, like Tom Cruise, Nicolas Cage, Sean Penn, uh, Richard Gere. Like, I'm a huge fan of those people first five years of their career. Uh, but when you say like Richard Gere, you don't think Days of Heaven, you don't think Breathless, you think like Runaway Bride or anything like beyond the point where I just forget that that ever happened. Same with Nicolas Cage. Same with Tom Cruise, same with Brad Pitt. Um, so I choose to like, he never got older than that. He died in a, in a plane crash in like, you know, 1984. So, um, so I think that might answer your question. Okay, thank you. All right. Um... Thanks, Chad, uh, for the uh, very rich uh, talk. Um, you know, it's just just like a web. It, just, it brand, you know, it branches out in so many uh, mediums and references. Um, you know, you you kind of you sort of create this constellation. You are making um, how your work is. You are sort of connecting the dots, but I, I don't always sort of know what um, sort of the yeah, always see the ideas underlying some of the connections, but in in the spirit, your 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 uh, way of your kind of presentation, the way you think about it is in the spirit of collage or scuzz as well, and that that seems that seems uh, sort of appropriate for kind of uh, because after all, your 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 work will be is um, the collages and themselves. Uh, I did appreciate uh, the. Um, your analysis of one collage, because I, I think I'd asked you a while ago, you know, could you single out one and can you unpack it a little bit just, you know, to kind of help help me out in the very least to kind of um, a case study as, as it were. Um, and then you, you, so you did that with the, uh, the, um, the collage that whose, whose foundation or bed is the, uh, the that's still from giant and you sort of showed how um, it is um, it is branching out into all these you know I guess intertextual references, some which may do, may occur to a viewer, but you know because of your obsessiveness and your love, you know it's going to it's going to go over the heads of even um, scholars or fans of of, of Dean, um, and that's just your own kind of path and your 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 your, your sort of preference for kind of history and um, biography uh, and a bit of kind of journalistic behind the scenes um, interest, which, which is separate from kind of the, the film's own aesthetics. And it's, um, but so I guess my question is um, that collage, um, you, it was great to see the, uh, you know, this, this sort of iconic pose, right, of Dean, and then you know Martin Sheen almost kind of surpasses it in Badlands. You know, he he embodies it so beautifully, and then you and then you you illustrate it quite well with um, uh, Newman. Um, and I think at some point I saw an image of of a uh, sort of Christian iconography that you threw into your presentation, <laughs> although you didn't really uh, discuss it much. But I see what you're getting at. But my question is. In making that collage, so my question is about your kind of technique as an artist. It seems to me that 
that's really sort of what's at stake here, is why do you, if, if you are, um, if really that, that pose of Dean is a more visual pose and it's interacting with um, other, um, you know, in a sort of the spirit of Warburg as Sergio mentioned, if it's, if that kind of almost Christ-like pose is um, gesturing with other uh, films and art historical references, uh, why don't you in that collage have say an image of, um, you know, the crucifixion or images of um, Martin Sheen in Badlands, uh, why do you instead go choose letters and words as the primary um, medium of expression to sort of unlock that collage when in your presentation, it seems to be really about this pose and the sort of the visuality of it and the iconicity of it. So why, if it's all iconic and all visual based for, in your thinking, why is it all hinging in, in its execution on letters uh, whose order from, to me sometimes seems to depend on chance as well as, as Sergio mentioned. So that, that, that would, yeah, I'm wondering if you can sort of maybe defend your choice there. Yeah, well, I hope I don't undo any, anything that I've established for myself, but I, um, when working on that series, all of those collages have as, as a, a type of like unconscious decisions with the lettering and um, very interesting things came out of it. Uh, I uh, very rarely would actually like put in secret messages. Sometimes I would, I put in a word, but then I'd put a letter before the word and a letter after the word, and the word just disappears, you know, stuff like that is in there. Specific movies were placed into the letters, you know, like the, the titles of the movies, those fonts. So, I mean, like things that were intentional there, but, um, I, I felt like I needed to keep the letters random and, and, and like a subconscious spewing of letters um, based on sizes or based on colors. Um, and then you take a step back and like the more you look at these collages, you start seeing these things that you like your brain like puts words in there, even though there aren't words in there. And I, and I knew that that was going to happen. And I was was just dead set on making a bunch of those collages and and I and I've been really happy with like discovering words or discovering connections with the image on accident um like the one sick kid that just happened and then all of a sudden I realized like sick like s-i-c is basically like this is collaged in here it doesn't look right but it's like this thing from another thing and it's out of context but it's correct in its own world it's correct like that was perfect and um and yes it's a stretch to like see breve is the only thing that's actually in there and yes it's spanish and and um only people who know spanish would know that's in there and to connect you know dean's short life with it. it's it's all it's all nonsense but it's you know i did it so who what you know if someone else sees it are they going to see those words or what words are they going to see and what connections are they going to make with that image? So there's an easy way to explain that. And there's a hard way to explain it. I did the hard way, but I, I don't know if it, if, if I gave you the enough of an answer. <laughs> well, I just, uh, I would, my follow-up would be why exclude sort of the iconic sort of images of Sheen and uh, Newman and Christ himself in that, in the pose that is, intertextually connected to the Dean pose in that still from Giant. Why, why exclude the more explicit kind of intertextual references to other films, art mm -hmm. history, uh, and instead you, instead, yeah, so, uh, so why, why are we not seeing those references, which are kind of discoveries on your part and in your presentation seem to be really what's motivating the piece? Yeah, well, I think other collages, collage artists like Hannah Hawk, um, people who have a lot of things going on, uh, larger collages, it's a, it's a style other people do. And if I, if I ever do that, it'll be just two images that are just rammed up against each other. And you're, you got one, you got the other, and it's a simple collision. 
but to like have a central image and then have little images out here. I've just, I've never made a collage like that. No interest in it. So it's more of like a subtle, a subtle, you know, working around that concept. I've, it's just a matter of taste. Like it's a, it's a kind of collage that I don't make. Uh, but I do like having, you know, James Dean here and then, um, and then Martin Sheen from Badlands up, up in this corner, you know, and, and there are two different collages, but you see that I'm, I'm like speaking the same language, you know? So I think that's where the, the, the installation comes in handy. Okay, like the smaller collages could then interact with each other. Yeah. On the, on the wall, okay. Yeah, it's like a, a world they all live in. Okay. I, I see your point though. It's just not a thing I do, I guess. I understand, thanks. Okay, I'm, uh, yeah, we're, I gotta ask, I gotta just ask one more thing. Like super fast. Give me a give me an Andy Warhol style answer for this, just so I can get the the question on record, Chad. Okay. Um, following in in Rachel's style, um, the you talk about Susan Stewart and the narrative of the souvenir, um, and versus the narrative of the owner. Like the narrative of the souvenir is the narrative of the owner. Yeah. In a way, right? Um, and I was just curious if, like if you think it's valuable for you to write more or redefine or reconsider further the, the nature of the souvenir in relationship to your collage work, because you're, you're starting to bring it up as a, a way of actually talking about the works. And you had mentioned the entry point uh, being readily available if people just spend enough time with it. But in a way that that quote is saying that no, you get the souvenir, like the souvenir that is at your friend's house or whatever is actually, that's their story that you don't have necessarily the relationship with. They have it run as a personal thing. Um, so I'm wondering if you need to rewrite in a way the definition of souvenir for your own work in some way. Yeah, I think that is, is there's like, there's a gap in there that I'm, that there's no connection between one and the other. Yeah, I totally see what you're saying. Uh, uh, I'll just say correct. That is correct. <laughs> uh, All right. I, I agree. I was just looking, I just want to get that on record. So you don't need to think, I mean, just something to think about, but let's open it up to the group. Who, who, who uh, the committee, or uh, unless the committee, I'm sorry, the committee, does anybody else have any other questions? All right, cool. All right, let's open it up to everyone. Does anybody in the audience have questions? Oh, wait, there's a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Doug. Hey, Chad. Uh, this is a really great presentation. I, I, uh, I've got a lot of ideas sort of swirling about. Um, so th thanks. This is, this is uh, just an interesting conversation to, to be able to bear witness to. Um, so kind of like Sergio, I've got some rhetorical mumblings here out of which I, I hope a question or at least a provocation for speech will arise. Um, Sergio was asking about the connection between your work and sort of randomness. And I'm thinking about the connection between your work and um, the clue or um, that which can be kind of decoded. And I'm struck by uh, one image in particular you had shown, which was um, Ray Johnson's sort of um, male art, uh, which I don't know if you can pull that back up. It's it's possible. Uh, it's just that sort of uh, collage, almost um, you know, somewhere between the rebus and the ransom note, a, um, a series of characters that that could be decoded, indeed were decoded into uh, you know a Latin alphabet. I, I have to un okay. Oh, was it this one? That's the one. Yes. Yes. So like you, I feel like this, there, there's a strong affinity between this image and, and the sort of connection to the past, the connection to this sort of, I don't know, uh, 1950s nostalgic sort of encapsulation of America and the presence of this sort of um, code, this, you know, sequence that can be uh, decoded, made sense of. And I, I feel like your work is also um, in some ways sort of engaging with both of those dialogues concurrently, right? Like um, you're very uh, in touch with um, 1950s film 
and um, the sort of 1950s pop aesthetic, let's say. And then um, you're, you know, at the same time, your work has these sort of encoded messages like the rebus, you know, um, you'd mentioned breve, the presence of a Spanish word, um, a sort of uh, phonetic uh, articulation of Newman in one of the collages you had sort of um, uh, shown up front. And I'm just thinking about these two sort of elements in the work, the, the connection to the past and this idea of sort of that which can be decoded and I'm wondering if I can pose you, you know, the question, to what extent is Scuzz an attempt to make sense of the past, sort of decode the past? And to what extent is, is Scuzz an, uh, an attempt to sort of bring the, the past into the present in order to make greater sense of our current circumstances? Thank you, really great talk. Yeah, thanks for that question. And by the way, um, through the entire talk, I kept thinking to myself, I forgot to thank Bruce Springsteen for inspiring you to go back to school and get your PhD and inspiring Katie to go get her MFA who inspired me to get my MFA. Uh, so I, it's just like, I, I couldn't stop. So I just had to ignore that I forgot it, but I got a chance, thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't have an easy answer for that one. Um, but I think, yeah, SCUS does two things. It, it like it takes away the power and it and it adds power and in a way I'm grabbing things from the past and I'm pulling them into the into the present and I'm making a statement about them just by putting them there and giving them a, a platform or tearing them down and not and you know like giving it to them and then taking it away um, and and I think the 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 triumphant gibberish that is soaring through the images um it it sometimes it like it improves the image and sometimes it it, it like destroys the image and I, and I feel like that comes across in a in a subtle kind of um subconscious way so I, i'm doing these subtle things and um and it, and it is about it is about like kind of choosing and 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 uh, kind of studying the images. I hope that that's probably the best answer I can give. Thanks for that question. All right. Um, I didn't see any other questions. There's no, I'm looking through for raised hands. So um, I think this will end um the public portion of the talk and we will go to a breakout room chat and, and be back in a few minutes to um to give you give you some feedback okay yeah i see it okay you, you all see it thanks chad under pressure <laughs> all right we'll be back in a few minutes Chad, do we go to a different room? Oh, because I, I have a thing join a room, right? They they went to a different room. When they come back, I think they're gonna they're gonna drill me. So I guess that's over after that. But thanks for coming, everybody. Oh thanks. yeah, great talk. Mine mine that was worked. so great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. I figured I'd hold I hold any questions. I uh, I just read a bunch. <laughs> I was gonna say that was quite uh well researched with the uh, meticulous detail related to weaving those uh historical elements together in the beginning yeah yeah flawless I mean, though i had to cut articulated so well i don't know how i would fact check any of that though so <laughs> <laughs> yeah might have fudged a couple numbers i don't know <laughs> which is kind of great though you're talking about like parafiction, like implausibility and all the, uh, or paratextualization. I think that like totally works. Yeah, yeah. It, I'm, uh, thank you for letting me do it. How do you feel? Uh, like nearly relaxed, nearly, Woo! yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> stop recording now.